This evening's lecture is about Henri Duc de Mal. Although he was the fifth son of Louis Philippe, he was born, and you'll hear all about this in a minute, in the Palais Royal. When we look at um, the family tree, one of the sons called Charles, who was his elder brother, died at the age of eight. So he hardly figures at all in the history of the French royal family and its connections with our own area of Twickenham. Twickenham, Richmond, and of course, Isha, where Louis Philippe died. So without more ado, I'm going to show you the family tree. Alan said this was very important for me to show you. And in fact, I've just done a new version of it, uh, copied a new version, shall we say, uh, it, it, it isn't quite, it's not completely accurate. They're all descended from Louis XIII, the King of, the, King of France. Very important. He was Le Roi de France. Louis Philippe was Le Roi des Français, the King of the French, because he was elected the King. That's the difference. Anyway, the son of Louis XIII was Louis XIV, and Louis XIV had a brother called Philippe du Doléans. Now, if any of you have seen that fantastic series, Versailles, you will see, and in fact, as uh, his son said, and it wasn't Louis-Philippe Egalité, Louis-Philippe Egalité, who was the father of Louis-Philippe, the one we know, who was connected with our town, uh, it actually jumps there. It's rather clever the way that, you see, one, two, jump. So he was the grandson of Philippe Egalité. Well, Philippe Egalité was a transvestite. And in fact, his son said, my father has got more dresses than my mother. So it was a well-known fact, but despite the fact that he liked dressing up as a woman, he was very, very active as a heterosexual man. So he did have children. Now, uh, when you think about it, Louis, uh, the Duc d'Orléans, um, Louis XIV and Philippe, Duc d'Orléans, were actually at the same time as um, Charles I. In fact, uh, Charles I's daughter married uh, Philippe Duc d'Orléans. So there's a great link between England and France. Anyway, so then we come over here, Louis XVI, right? Well, unfortunately, he had a very nasty accident when a nasty blade came down and took his head off with most of his family. And his legitimate heir, Louis the Seventeenth, uh, well, he was captured and he mysteriously disappeared. Now, Louis the Eighteenth was the first, he was the Comte de Provence, and he went back to France, and then there was the Comte d'Artois. All of this is in the lecture that I gave you about the French emigres in Richmond. Anyway, uh, Charles the Tenth, his grandson was Henri Comte de Chambord. Well, he died, and once he died, there, there were no other legitimate heirs to the French throne. All right, you'd have to go and look amongst some people in Spain, etc. But in fact, it was once uh, the Henri Comte de Chambord uh, died, then it was no, there was no, that, that was when the people that we talk about became the legitimate heirs to the throne of France, and they are still the legitimate heirs. So then we get Louis Philippe, who was married to Marie Amélie de Bourbon Sicile. Um, she was the sister of Marie Antoinette, and she was also the sister of Marie Hélène, who was Napoleon's um, second wife. And of course, this is one of the things that Alan kept on asking me why do they have all these titles? Well, it's the same thing in our own royal family different titles. Uh, it would seem that the people in Yorkshire, in York, don't want a certain Andrew to be their patron anymore. So what happens there? But anyway, theoretically, the second son of the monarch of England is always the Duke of York. Anyway, so he was the Duke de Valois, the Duke de Chartres, the Duke d'Orléans, King of the French. Well, when his father was um, the Duke d'Orléans, this is Philippe Égalité, uh, he was the Duke de Chartres. So, and in fact, actually, at the end of his life, when he was exiled to England, to Isha, he was known as the Comte de Ney. Ney, as you know, is a suburb of Paris. Um, and in fact, 
uh, there was a summer palace that they lived in. They lived in pavilions. It's all gone, unfortunately. Uh, but um, in fact, that apparently was where the first potatoes were grown in France by Monsieur Parmentier, who discovered them. Um, as, as we have Rally, we, they had Parmentier. Then you have Antoine Duc de Montpensier, that was his brother. I spoke about all of this when we saw the Orléans family in uh, Twickenham, which was the first lecture. So now we come to the next line. This is where we are now. Ferdinand Duc d'Orléans, who married Helen de mecklenburg schwerin Very interesting, if you go to the uh, mausoleum in Dreux, you will see that she is outside the main mausoleum, putting her hand over her husband's effigy because she was Protestant. So she, had, she hasn't got the right to be in um, the Catholic part. Well, the, the whole thing is Catholic, but it's a concession that she's allowed there. Then you've got Louise, who married Leopold I, King of the Belgians. His second marriage, because his first marriage was to La Princesse Charlotte, who was the daughter of George the Fourth. George the Fourth. Then Marie, now Louis Duc de Nemours. So Louis Duc de Nemours was the second son of um, uh, Louis Philippe. And in fact, he was married to Victoria Saxe Coburg, another Protestant, who was in fact Queen Victoria's cousin. Francoise, well, she only lived for two years and she was baptized, as you know, because he was here, Louis Philippe, from 1815 to 1817. Uh, they, a lot of them were born in France, as you see. But, but um, after the, uh, when Napoleon made his return, it was time to leave again. So there's constantly in this story comings and goings across the channel. Clementine, who married August of, August, Augustus of Saxe Coburg, got up. Uh, Francois Pires de Joinville, he also lived in Twickenham. He was uh, profoundly deaf. He had many operations. And his wife was Francoise of Brazil. She was a Duarte, obviously, because Duarte is the ruling house of Brazil. And her father was the emperor of Brazil. Sorry, ruling house of Portugal. Uh, Brazil being a colony of Portugal. Then we come to Henri Duc d'Aumal, who was actually the fifth son, but uh, as I told you, Charles is not mentioned here because he died at the age of eight. And he married Marie Caroline of Naples, known as Lina. Only two of their many children survived. You see, I'm sure they knew about it, but consanguinity of bloods. And this is why we discourage people from marrying their cousins, because all the bad things happen. Um, a very big example of that, of course, is Toulouse-Lautrec, who was uh, very deformed because he was the product of two first cousins. And then we have Antoine Duc de Montpensier. It's very interesting. The way that Dick Cashmore did this when he did this book was to put all, the, everybody, all these people actually visited Twickenham, but only the ones in black were either born in Twickenham or lived here. And uh, so now I think that's clear, is it not? So we're now going on. So that is um, Marie Amélie with her two youngest sons. Uh, the boy on the left, as you look at the picture, is the Duc Henri d'Aumal, and the other one is the Duc de Montpensier, who married the Infanta of Spain and whose daughter married the grandson of Louis Philippe. In other words, Omal's nephew. And there, of course, they were born in the Palais Royal, which was the palace which belonged to Philippe Egalité. He was called Egalité because when there were many um, people starving in Paris, he sold a lot of his pictures. And in fact, he allowed his palace to become really a place for shopkeepers. So the other, the other apartments were let out. Um, and in fact, if you go there now, all along the bottom are shops. And of course, that building here, of course, is La Comédie Française. And there, of course, is Louis Philippe, who was known as the Citizen King. So he was le, le roi des Français. Il n'était pas le roi de France the last man to be um, enthroned in uh, Notre Dame Cathedral was Charles X, 
who when he was in England was known as the Comte d'Artois. But that, I won't go on any more about that because that's all in the other story. So as I say, if you want a reference, please look at my other lectures. Now, why was it <clears throat> that the Omal was so rich? Well, he inherited 600 million, he inherited 66 million livres, which is about 200 million now, it's even more. He inherited the fortune of Le Prince de Condé. This is Louis Henri de Prince de Condé. Now, his, his son, when he was the, uh, he was one of the richest men in France. He owned immense wealth. He owned Chantilly, and you know how big that is. But he owned all the land round there, which is the, the, the district of the Oise. It's the prefecture of the Oise, O-I-S-E. Later about that. Now there you see the Duc d'Anguin. He had escaped during the revolution. Oh, this man, Louis-Henri de Prince de Condé, he like so many of them, ended up in London. And uh, he had a lady friend who was an Englishwoman. Her name was Sophie Dawes, and she became La Baronne Fercher. Uh, she was made a Baronne uh, to make her acceptable to polite French society. Anyway, after the abduction um, of the Duke d'Anguin, that is his son, the natural heir, from Austria by uh, Napoleon's men. He was brought to um, Vincennes uh, prison and um, castle. I mean, when I say castle, I don't mean a chateau in the sense of it's a country house. It is a chateau fort. It's a real castle. Difference between a chateau or chateau as the old way of pronouncing it is because as you know, the circumflex accent means that there's an S missing. Chat Castel originally, you see. So it is Le Chateau, and uh, he was shot in the, in the moat. So that was why his godson, uh, who was Louis um, Henri, uh, Duc de Mal, inherited this immense fortune at the age of eight. So he died in uh, 1830, and uh, as I think I told you, the Duc de Mal was born in 1822. And this is the castle, the Chateau uh, Palace of Chantilly. Now that, this was all um, smashed up during the Re French Revolution. That bit was the only bit that was still remaining after the revolutionaries had completely sacked the whole place. So one of the life's, wo the, the life's work of Omal was to restore it. M more of that later. Notice there are lots of horses. Well, of course, now it is where there's a famous racetrack. Uh, now, going back, as you can see, that is the front of the Palais Royal, which is opposite the Louvre, and, is in, and it is in the, in the centre of the town. And uh, as I told you, uh, it's where the, the Comédie Française is, and there's lots of shops and restaurants. And at the other end of that um, garden, which I showed you, is a f wonderful restaurant called the Verfour, the best restaurant in Paris, apart from, I think it's even better than Maxime's. I've eaten in both of them. <coughs> For the Verfour, you have to, it's only open at lunchtime and you have to book up three months in advance. And the food is superb. And when you go there, they've got all the names of the famous people that were in that restaurant. It, it is one of the first restaurants in France, probably one of the first restaurants in the world. But that's another story. So he was educated at home and his tutor was a man called um, uh, Alfred Auguste Cuvillier Fleury, who lived from 1802 to 1887. And after he'd ceased to be um, his tutor, uh, he became his personal secretary. So he was always with the family. He finished his studies quite young and he passed his baccalaureate. He was fourth in the whole of France, or he might have been first. All I know is that all those brothers had the highest marks in the, in the, in the, in the, in the baccalaureate of the year in which they were 16. Um, and there he is at the age of 16, 
as a, in, a, in an army uniform because he went straight into the army as a lieutenant. I won't go into all his ranks because that gets too complicated. But that is the famous Lycée Henri IV. Now, this is a fabulous picture by Horace Vernet, who was the court painter of the time. And if you go to the Wallace Collection in London, you will see many pictures by Horace Vernet. Now, um, I, actually, it's supposed to be 1837 that they all rode out from, fr from the front of Versailles. But when you look at them, these boys, I mean, they were only 15, 13, he was only 13, he was only 15, and they've got beards. Well, I think that's a bit advanced, but anyway, there you are. So I, I've never seen a list of who, I know who they all are, but I've never seen a list in order, so I had to work it out. Well, of course, there is Fernand, Fernand Duc d'Orléans here, next to his father. So let's start on the end. That is the Prince de Joinville. Remember this picture? was painted in 1837. Uh, Louis Philippe didn't live all that much actually at, he hardly lived at Versailles, he hardly lived at Fontainebleau. Obviously he went there. His main residence was in the Tuileries and also uh, this is where some of them were born and of course where, that's when he became the king. Before he became the king as I've told you he was in the Palais Royal. But um, they had another summer residence at Ney. Unfortunately, all smashed down during the 1870 Commune. And it was in fact a lot of little um, bungalows there. It, very, very nice at Ney, just before you come to um, the Seine, opposite boulogne billancourt So let's go there. That is the Prince de Joinville, who was the Admiral, who married uh, Fra Francesca Duarte of uh, Brazil. That is the Duke de Montpensier. Uh, he married an Infanta of Spain, and in fact that put pay to the um, original Entente Cordiale that was organized in 1846 when Louis Philippe made the state visit and came to Twickenham the first time uh, as the King of France. Sorry, the king of the French, mustn't get it wrong. Anyway, um, that was scuppered by the marriage of uh, uh, Montpensier to the Infanta of Spain because um, the British didn't like the French getting too pally with uh, the, the Spaniards. And here, of course, is Fernand, uh, Duc de Montpensier, father of Le Comte de Paris, married to uh, mecklenburg schwerin and as you, as you know, in the last story, I told you how he had a terrible carriage accident when he was on his way to Ney, after he'd been in the Tuileries, he was going to see his parents before he set off for maneuvers. And um, the horse ran away. Uh, he jumped down to try and pull the horse upright and then he fell over, hit his head, and he died in a very uncertain, nasty circumstance on a load of old rags in a, um, a local epicerie. Well, it's near the Port Mayo. It's near where there's the Great Congress Center uh, in, in Paris. And in fact, when they built Le Congrès, they had to pull down the chapel that was on the site of where he had died and move it somewhere else. Now, the next one along, never quite sure. I think that is the Duc de Namur. I've worked it out from the uniforms. And there, of course, is the Duc uh, de Domal. Well, he looks a lot older than 15, because if this is 1837, he was born in 1822, he'd only be 15. So I think it's a little bit of a, a fantasy. But in any way, it's a wonderful picture, and it shows Louis Philippe in all his glory. Now, um, this is very important. Uh, in 1843, the Duc de Mal uh, actually uh, ca captured the Abdel Kader. Abdel Kader was the em emir of, um, of, uh, of Algeria, a very, very, very brilliant man, wonderful, wonderful, uh, brilliant uh, theologian. He was a wonderful person. Anyway, this is where he surrenders to the Duc de Mal, and this is the taking of the Schmala. The Schmala was the, um, the camp where all his followers were. I don't know how many people died, but anyway, that was when the French army beat them in 1843. Well, after that, when he was made prisoner, 
uh, he wasn't just thrown into a prison. He was sent to Amboise, which is one of the chateaux of the Loire. Again, another chateau that um, the Duke de Mal spent a lot of money on restoring. Anyway, he lived there writing, um, but a lot of, unfortunately, with all his follow, a lot of his followers, but they all died because it was too cold for them in that chateau. He didn't, thank goodness. Anyway, he went on to have uh, to return. After, he was liberated by Napoleon III in um, 1871. No, not 1871. I'm telling a lie now. In 1850, he was returned to um, his homeland. And in fact, he was living in Libya when the Druze, as you know, who are the people who do not like the Christians, the Maronites, who live on Mount Lebanon, and he saved the lives of many of the Christians. So you can see he was quite a wonderful man. Anyway, there you see, uh, in 1847 to 1848, the Duc de Mal uh, became the governor general of Algeria. It was actually the 27th of September, 1847, to 24th of February, 1848. Well, we all know what happened in February, 1848. That is, in fact, when there were riots in Paris and when uh, Louis Philippe um, resigned as the king of the French and came to back to England and ended up living in Clermont, which, as I told you before, was the home of Charlotte, Princess Charlotte, who at the age of 21 gave birth to a child and she died in the process. That was the first wife of Leopold von Saxe-Coburg, who was Queen Victoria's uncle. Many of you have come across uh, Leopold of Saxe-Coburg, um, Gotha, when um, we saw the film about the young Victoria. Anyway, he actually was given a pension for life by the British government under the direction of George IV, who liked spending other people's money as well. And um, the house was his for life. So it was quite convenient when his daughter, sorry, when his uh, wife, his new wife, who was Louise de France, that was Louis Philippe's daughter, she was married to um, Leopold, the first king of the Belgians in 1830. They had mooted the idea of the Duc de Nemours. Remember, the Duc de Nemours was the second son, and in fact, after the death of Ferdinand, he was the eldest boy, the eldest. But he wasn't the heir to the throne, because the heir to the throne, of course, was Le Comte de Paris, who was the first son of... of... Um, Ferdinand and um, the lady of Saxe Coburg got her. Now, when they came back, they went to this beautiful house, which I said belonged, was given to Leopold. Oh, by the way, when um, uh, the next one came along, that was Albert. Oh, the government didn't give him a pension for life. And they, and although Queen Victoria wanted him to become the king. And of course, if, um, Albert of saxe coburg Gotha had uh, become the King of England with her, then of course, who knows? Prince Philip would have been the King of England because there would have been the precedent. Something to think about. But um, no, they didn't, want to, they didn't want to give anybody a pension for life then. Uh, after, after she died, he kept that pension for life and he kept the rights to the house. Although of course it was Queen Victoria that allowed them to stay there. Now, they weren't there for very long before they had to move. Remember, the place had not been inhabited uh, since um, the death of um, Charlotte, which was uh, in 1820 something, and uh, they moved in in 1848. So therefore it had been in uninhabited for over 20, nearly 30 years. So it was terribly damp, it was terribly cold there. And what is more, there was terrible lead poisoning in all the pipes. So poor Marie-Emily became ill as so many of them did. So what did they do? They moved um, to Richmond to, to stay in the Star and Garter Hotel, which was on the site of what became the Star and Garter home, which is now a hotel again, or not a hotel, it's luxury flats. 
um, which is what is the equivalent of Les Invalides. Anyway, uh, here we are. This is uh, from the, um, the um, London, uh, you know, the, the Illustrated London News. Um, and it was in September uh, of, um, he died in, on the 26th of August, 1850. This is Louis Philippe. And he was buried in St. Charles Borromeo, the mausoleum. I'm not quite sure when they erected that mausoleum, but they must have erected it because he wasn't terribly well very quickly because that served as the mausoleum for the Orléans family until they were allowed to all be buried back in Paris in the Chapelle Royale in Dreux, worth visiting. So there we see the, the uh, imitation. Actually, I was gonna show two pictures, but in fact, if ever you see it, it is almost an exact copy of the huge Chapelle Royale, which was built originally by Dorothy de Pontéev, who was Louis Philippe's mother. So there we are. So this, and notice, I told you about this. This is um, the Duc de Namur, shaven. That is Omal, and that, of course, is Joinville, very noticeable because of his thick beard. And this is the 12 year old 1850 he was born in 1838 right this is the Comte de Paris who was the future pretender to the throne and his name he was named Louis Philippe Albert well you can guess why he was called Albert because Albert Albert was Queen Victoria's husband and there we see the best picture I've ever found and only found it today of Claremont, which is now a school originally founded by the Christian scientists for girls. Now it's a mixed school. They had two schools, Fancourt and Claremont. They're both, they're both in each, both in near Isha. Uh, they closed the boys school down. That's Fancourt. And they just go to Claremont now. But it's very interesting. That picture is 1860. Marie Amélie did not die until 1866. And when they first came to, um, England again in 1848, they all lived in that house. Notice there are the arms of the French royal family outside. And there we have where he came, the Duc de Mal to, in 1852, he came to Twickenham and he bought, in my French book, it said as this book, if, my, if I'm using this as my reference book, it's a wonderful book, an awful lot in there. Been reading it on and off for months, years. And um, so if I've got a lot of information, there's a lot in there. Apparently, he paid in francs 700,000. I reckon the pound, I've just tried to work out what the rate of exchange between the pound and the franc was in 1852. Well, let's say that it was 10 francs to the pound, which it was before we went into um, oh, um, the Euro. And so that was 70,000 pounds, which was a lot of money in those days, but he spent a huge amount on. Now, as I told you, the immense fortune came from the wealth of the Prince de Condé. And it wasn't just the money that he was left, he was left all the lands, because the Condé family owned immense lands all over France. So, um, he really was the financier for the whole family. And in fact, um, the Namours lived there for a while when they, when after, after the Namour, who was the eldest of the sons after the death of Ferdinand, he lived with his mother, Marie-Emilie in Claremont until she died in 1866. And so uh, Queen Victoria very, very kindly, and remember his wife was Queen Victoria's cousin, um, he, um, he ended up living in Bushy House, which was the Rangers house in Bushy Park. Worth visiting, uh, occasionally it is open on one of those open days. It's a museum of scientific instruments, not surprisingly because it's on the grounds of the National Physical Laboratory in Teddington. Anyway, so until he was living there with his wife and children, he lived with uh, uh, um, the Duc de Mal and Lina. Interesting to look at this building. 
the former owner who sold it to him was a man called the Earl of Kilmory, known as Black Jack Needham, who then moved to Isleworth to what was um, uh, Mariah Gray College. It's um, by the Gordon House by the river, if any of you know it. The house is still there. The grounds are covered in flats. Now, this is where he had his library. Oh, he was a great book collector. He was a great art collector. And the whole place, in fact, actually, in my book, it calls it Le Musée de Twickenham. So we know we have our little museum in Twickenham, but this, this was Le Musée de Twickenham. So there he, this is on, this is in 18, there were two big events in 1864 and 1866. Um, he organized um, lots of events to raise money for poor people. And in fact, this was a, um, a what they call in French, in fête champêtre. Well, it was a garden party in aid of la Société Française de Bienfaisance. Now that still exists, the Société de Bienfaisance. And in fact, they run the French dispensary in Hammersmith where people who are not well off in France can go and get medicine free. Anyway, so this is, this I think, if we go back, that's the front overlooking the gardens and the Thames is really to your right down below. So I think this is the back of his library. Oh, he was a book collector. In fact, he had, a, he had a, another flat up in London in uh, Northumberland Street and he used to um, buy books from all over France and England and the most expensive um, uh, bindings. And there, of course, is the, um, the, the bandstand. So um, these, these, he organized a lot of garden parties to raise money for all sorts of things like books for the children of St. Mary's School. They were great benefactors, not only of their own people, Remember, they were still in exile during the reign of um, Napoleon III, and they weren't allowed to go back to France until 1870, uh, when apparently at uh, Dover, it was rather embarrassing. You've got the French, and Napoleon III, uh, no, not Napoleon III, in fact, it was um, Eugenie, because she um, came to England before her um, husband, Napoleon III was incarcerated in Willemshalle I mean, as a reprisal because, in fact, the French had started the Franco-Prussian War. Won't go into all of that. So they had to pay reprisal. But, you know, because of <clears throat> Louis-Philippe and um, Napoleon III, France had become one of the richest countries in Europe. So they were able to pay the Germans off within one year. And apparently, uh, when he came back, his wife was down there, and of course the, the Napoleonic family, they were going, sorry, the, the Orléans family were going back to France. So as Napoleon III left, they came back. So there was a bit of a, a crossing of the ways. And in fact, in 1846, I think I told you this, possibly I didn't, when um, um, Louis-Philippe came on the famous state visit to Windsor, they, they, they made a tour down to his old house. And there's a famous picture, which is in Orléans house by a man called Pangre. Pangre was the court artist. He was the court um, aquarius watercolorist. And in fact, he documented the whole of that stay. Anyway, they all met at Orléans gardens and Orléans house. And um, there we are. So. Uh, as I said, not only, I don't know, because um, I understand from uh, Mr. Sewell, who is the secretary or the president of the rowing club, that the, the books, which were the original minute books of the club, the rowing club or the boat club, uh, have disappeared. So all we know is the first president of the rowing club was Louis, was uh, Henri Duc de Mal. And of course, actually in his youth, he was a bit of a rower himself. He used to row on the, on the Seine. And uh, his brother obviously could row. He was a sailor, although they say that sailors don't always know how to swim. But they used to spend a lot of the time swimming in the Seine. They were very, very athletic, very, very clever. And I think they were probably very charming. 
Anyway, the Duke de Mal, who seems to be a very nice chap, I'd love to have met him. I think he would have been a very nice man. Um, he, I'm sure he gave money towards the founding of that club. But all we know is he was the president for life and, until he died in um, 1897. And he was only 75. He was only a year older than me. My goodness. Um, anyway, there we are. This is all the people who come to the Fête Champêtre. And this is the back of his library. And there you see the wonderful conservatory. <clears throat> Originally, the conservatory was designed for Needham. Uh, and it was an art gallery as well. So there we are. And when he went back to France, he took all his paintings back with him. Um, now, this is interesting. That is the house before the embellishments. Uh, it doesn't show that this is the park, Orleans Park, and that there is a road in between. Notice the um, boathouse. Well, the boathouse is gone, but there is a platform there at the end of Marble Hill park which is where the steamers can come up next to hamilton's boat house and um where the skiffs can be hired notice that they didn't have the library there and also it seems to have been dis destroyed very quickly because on the building which one sees which is the wreck of the building i didn't show that too distressing that was all bought for the local borough by mrs ioannidis who was toby jessel who was our last MP before, no, he wasn't the last MP. The last MP was, of course, um, Vincent Cable. Before Vincent, we had a short period when there was a young doctor who was a member of the Conservative Party. And then, well, Vince um, Jessel was the last long standing Conservative MP for Twickenham. Now, I discovered today that these pictures were made by, uh, painted by, um, a man called um, Mr. Stand, I think his name was, and they were painted on the orders of Lady Frances Waldegrave, who was the lady who lived in Strawberry Hill. So this is the Duc de Mal. So when you work it out, um, he was born in 1822. He's about 40 there. And there is his, his wife, Lena, who um, she was born in 1822 as well, but uh, they only had two surviving sons. The rest of them died in very, very young infancy or they were still born. Perhaps this was a result of them being first cousins. Anyway, there is Lady Frances Waldegrave, there's Strawberry Hill, and that is her fourth husband because she did actually have a, a, a husband before she married both of the Waldegrave brothers. And um, in fact, she had to marry the second of her Waldegrave uh, husbands, that's her third husband in Scotland, because in England it was illegal for a woman to marry her brother-in-law. Going back to the old adage of the Bible, thou shalt not see the nakedness of thy brother's wife. Anyway, it was, a, it was legal in Scotland, but not in England. And of course, she was a great Whig, um, not a Tory. She was a member of what, what became the Liberal Party. And her husband, um, uh, his name was um, oh, Chichester Fortescue. Um, he was uh, a politician. She was so rich. And of course, all the money from the Waldegrave family and the Warpole family be uh, came from the mines of Radstock, which in fact was where my family were all connected. My great great grandfather was the Sawyer who cut up all the pit props for the, for the mine. So a lot of my father's family on his maternal side were from the Radstock mine. And that is, was the, the source of all the money for the Waldegrave family. Anyway, there we are, Strawberry Hill. Uh, now we come on to the next, in 1864, <coughs> the Comte de Paris, remember he was the 12 year old boy in the picture at the funeral, he married his first cousin, who was the daughter of the Duc de Montpensier and the Infanta of Spain. Apparently she was a very masculine woman, but they didn't manage to have some children. And um, apparently she smoked cigars and r loved riding horses and um, a very horsey person. And uh, after they'd been exiled again, it was all to do with the Spanish, to, the, to do with the Portuguese marriage this time 
because um, his daughter, this is Comte de Paris, this is Comte, Le Comte de Paris, Louis Philippe Albert, as I said to you, probably named after Albert von Saxburg von Gotha. And uh, they, they lived in Orleans House before all the embellishments. Now, those are, that is the elder son of uh, the Duke de Mal. His name was the, the, the um, this is Louis Prince de Condé. So he took his title and he was the last Prince de Condé from the man whose money his father inherited when he was an eight year old boy in 1830. So there he is. Um, he, at the age of, um, he was born in um, 1826 um, and he went to Australia in the company of his doctor, who was the doctor uh, in, um, it was a family doctor whose name escapes me for the moment, but it began with a G. And um, he went to Australia and he, unfortunately, he, um, he learned of his grandmother's death, 1866. He was so affected by it that it upset him terribly. And also he caught a terrible cold when he went swimming from which he didn't recover. So he died of typhoid fever in May of 1866 in Australia. He'd been, they'd been on, he'd been on a tour of Australia, Manila, etc., and in, in company with his elder cousin, the Duc d'Alençon, who was the son of the Duc de Nemours, the person who was married to Queen Victoria's cousin and who lived in Bushy Park. Lena is there with her eldest son, and uh, then this is Twickenham Station. It was very, very sad. Because there was no telegraph line between Australia and um, even India at that time, and Europe definitely, the death, the death was not announced until June 1866. Now, Louis Philippe, um, not Louis Philippe, um, the Duc de Mal was going up to London uh, to find out if there was any news, and he was going on the up line to, to London, passing via, um, it was passing via Richmond Station then, before the line went all the way around the houses because the line did not go directly from Waterloo to Windsor, as we know. So it, it, it wasn't, wasn't until the, the railway bridge that they were able to have a line directly from uh, Twickenham straight up to Waterloo. <clears throat> anyway, and in fact, Waterloo wasn't built then, it, they'd, gone to, they'd have gone to Vauxhall. So he was on his way up to London and the, um, the doctor was just coming down and he got off the train on the down train and he said to the Duke, oh, the Duke said to him, oh, you're up early. He said, yes. He told him the sad news. He came back to tell Marie, Marie Lena, as she was known, and um, it, she was so affected by this that she didn't live very, she only lived another three years. So remember, she just lost her son um, and um, she died of uh, pulmonary embolism. Her, she always had a weak chest. And um, so that she died in 1869. Next son. Now that is her youngest son, who was the, I mean, he was called the Duke de Guise. But in fact, there were three other, there were two others before him because they'd all died either very, very young or they were still born. And he was, his title went to one of his cousins later on, one of the cousins that lived in Ham of all places. Anyway, the body that I was telling you about did not come back until the 11th of September on the ship, the Sea Star. So that was what happened to the poor Pastor Condé. So anyway, here we are. Remember in 1872, by this time, uh, the Duc de Mal was allowed back to France and he was living, he bought a beautiful house 
for his son to live in the Boulevard Haussmann so he could go to this fantastic school called the Lycée Condorcet. Well, anybody who knows about France knows that that is probably the most elite school. It's still free, you don't have to pay, but um, uh, and it, 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 there's no boarding facilities and it's now mixed, but that was the school that Jean-Paul Sartre taught in, and Jean-Paul Sartre went to. If you look up the alumni of the Lycée Condorcet, it's even more impressive than the alumni of either Eton or Harrow, to mention two English schools. So, and if you, if you can't, if you have to come from outside Paris, um, you can stay with a family, but they don't have any boarding facilities there. So they had families that were the guests of the, the hosts of these very brilliant young people. That is taken about 1920, but it shows you the building is still the same, the Lycée Condorcet. And his father built, bought him a beautiful house in the Boulevard Haussmann so that he could live there with, of course, um, Cuvillier Fleury, who was still around, who was the tutor. And he, he died, and this is very sad, he was taking, if anybody knows the French system, uh, in France, they have not just the sixth form, but they have les classes préparatoires, which means a third year in the sixth form, much in the same way as they used to be for the Oxbridge entrance. And in the classe préparatoire, you sit the exams for les grandes écoles. Now we come to the great Chantilly. If you remember, I'm not going to go back all the way to the beginning, but the original chateau of the Condé family was wrecked and destroyed by the French in the revolution, by the revolutionaries, <coughs> not the French, but people in the French revolution. Now here, it's a complete re reconstruction. He was so rich, he poured all his money into this. He did in fact become the député, that's the MP for that area. And although they wanted to kick him out again after the, the, the Portuguese marriage, he managed to stay on and uh, he spent a huge amount of money. He renovated it. He gave his whole collection of art and books to the nation. So here's the library. Now, this is, in fact, a great chapel where all the hearts of the um, Prince de Conde are kept. So when the person dies, as was the case with the last Pastor Condé, that is the young boy, 22 years old, who died in Sydney, Australia. And as I said, his body didn't actually come back to, to England until um, September of that, the 11th of September. And then of course, uh, they weren't living in France then. So he in fact was put in the, in, in the um, Charles Borromeo, um, mausoleum in Weybridge before he went to Dreux. But his heart was kept in a separate um, thing and kept with all the Prince de Condé. And there we see there's a rotunda. If ever you go to York House, which is our town hall, there is a room. Because remember York House was built, uh, was developed by, a lot of it was added to, by the last Duc d'Orléans, who we will see in a minute. So there's a room uh, it's an octagon room inside um, the Chateau de Chantilly with little pictures of all his palaces, one of which is Twickenham. And there, of course, is a piece of, furn a piece of chimney uh, furniture which came from Orléans House. When he came back as a memento, he took that with him to Chantilly. Now there you see the Musée de la, de, 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 du Cheval. This is a museum devoted entirely to breeds of horses and there's a huge stable there. And there is the, the, Duc, the Duc de Mal on the horse. He was given the horse, not in obviously bronze, but the original horse was given to him by Abdel Kader on his uh, surrender. And round the... Um, it's called L'Hemicycle du Duc d'Aumal. Around the bottom of the, um, um, trip, I can't remember what, the, 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 the monument on which the horse stands are scenes in bronze of the capture of the Schmala. 
and there he is, the Duc de Mal, and that is what he was like at the end of his life. I mean, this was when he was only about 70 years old, and he um, got rather tired. And there, that is a caricature uh, from um, Vanity Fair. And there we have the Dreux. I spent a whole day in Dreux. It was absolutely wonderful. And all the bodies are there, all the effigies. Some people may feel it a bit macabre. But now there you are. That was, um, that was a picture of the Duc d'Orléans. Uh, he was the man who inherited the whole fortune. He was the son of the Comte de Paris. And um, he was born in Twickenham. Yes, in York House. And he bought York House. By this time, I think it was allowed for French people to buy things because all the negotiations until, until that time had to be through Coots, the bankers, the royal bankers. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't think they, they'd have me as an, a, a, an account customer at Coots. I think you've got to be rather special to be an account customer there. Anyway, that is the last of the Duc d'Orléans. He was born in 1869 and he died in Palermo in 1926. Uh, he split from his wife, who was a, um, a German princess, um, Dorothy. Poor Dorothy spent most of her time at York House and they weren't there for all that long. He bought it in 1897 and he spent most of the time doing it up. That's why it's such a wonderful place, our town hall, with um, um, the, the Clarendon Hall is in fact a swimming pool underneath. Um, there's the, another hall which was where he had all his um, stuffed animals. All the Duke of uh, Orléans stuffed animals, as he was a great hunter, are actually in Paris in the Musée uh, des Plantes. It's, the, uh, it's uh, the, the Natural History Museum in Paris. He, that, they, they were, he left them that. He had a, his, his yacht was more like a ship. Just shows how rich they were. And um, he was the second president of the rowing club became that in 1897 when his um, great uncle uh, the Duc de Mal died. So there he is dressed in all his, he's got the Toison d'Or, the Golden Fleece which is a Spanish honour. Now this is something I want to point out to you, this is the blazon or the coat of arms of the Orléans family and notice the colour is azure blue. Well look at the gables of the Twickenham Yacht Club the Twickenham Rowing Club, sorry, and they're blue as well in honour of the man who was their first president, and I wouldn't be surprised if he gave them a lot of money as well. Well, he certainly gave a lot of money to people in Twickenham, um, and so did his, um, so did his um, nephew, the Duke, the Comte de Paris, he gave 80,000 when he came, and it was the, the Comte de Paris that bought the freehold of the land on which the rowing club Boathouse stands. And there we have also in his memory, I should think he gave the money in 1858 and 1860, was a row of cottages down by the river, down by the Barmy Arms, if you know that part of Twickenham at all. It's a very nice pub opposite Eelpie Island, opposite the rowing club, and it's called O'Mal Cottages. And I've had several friends living there, one of whom died last year at the age of 91. And she was the daughter of one of the last boatmen of the Hamilton family, very famous um, rowers, rowers and, and boatsmen. Her father died of a, when a, a V2 a v, um, rocket hit the town, and it was in 1944, and the shock killed him. Body apparently wasn't touched, but he died of the shock. And Frida lived in that house until she died a year ago, and very old friend, I knew her since I was 16. So there you are. That's it. End of story. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed it.